the American general public, like the general public any place, cares about itself and its own interests, its own um, situation in their own families and their own work and their own jobs and their own children's education and health. And the political uh, activities in their own countries are always uh, I I interested. Um, in terms of the American public's interest in China has been uh, shaped uh, in recent time by what they read in the, and see in the media. They see two, two kinds of problems. One is a, a, a conflict with the U.S. Uh, in which uh, there are fundamental, real fundamental issues. And they see um, problems in China in terms of what they would perceive to be human rights and uh, a lack of certain freedoms. So those are the two kinds of characteristics that they see to the exclusion of everything else. I mean, there are real issues in both of those categories, but in order to understand the full picture, you really have to understand a much bigger picture of China. Uh, but that's not easy to do uh, because people have limited attention spans, they have limited interest, and um, when we look at other societies, all people, when you look at another society, you see you see a simplicity in another society. You see a homogeneity. It's, it's one thing. When you look at your own self, your own family, your own society, you see all the complexity, the problems, the issues. But when you see somebody else, you just see it in, in, in a superficial way. And so that's part of the problem, in, you know, both when U.S. and China look at each other, um, that, is the, that is the case. Uh, most people have a good spirit. They, they, they have the right intent. Um, but sometimes we have to be sensitive to how other people react uh, and appreciate. Um, it's not just, if I say something that you misunderstand, it's not your fault. It's my fault for not communicating properly. That's the way I look at it. Um, some people think if I say something and you, you misunderstand me, it's your fault. But I don't think so. I think it's my fault that I have not been clear in, in my communication. So we all have to strive to make sure that people who don't know us well uh, really do understand the reality. And so um, oftentimes when, when I hear China criticized, by uh, Western media. What I try to do is, is, not, um, is not to take the opposite side because then, then it becomes, then it's, a distor it's another distortion, but rather to tell an accurate, nuanced, complex story. So the, the real story is always more complicated than the, than the simple story. So it's harder to tell, especially in the media where you have three or four minutes. Whenever I do, uh, you know, CNN or BBC and or CNBC, uh, I, I, you know, the, the maximum time I've ever had is like six or seven minutes, and usually it's about four. And so you have to tell a whole story in a very short time. And it's very, and, and the tendency is to sort of to tell a simple story in the opposite direction of the, of the errors of thinking. But that sometimes makes the problem worse. You have to try to tell a, a nuanced, complicated story in a very short time. I'm going to be overly simplistic. In the U.S., a rising China is a threat. And in China, the perception is, simplistically, that the U.S. motivation is to contain China and stop its rise. So that's the simplistic uh, feelings in both countries. It's been true for a, a long time at a low level. What we have today is that level has been raised. And so now that's an overt perception among uh, many common people, but also political leaders or, or officials. There's now a belief that that's the case, that in the, US, in the U.S. they believe a rising China is a threat, not just to the U.S., but to the world. And in China, the feeling is that the U.S. motivation, trade war, all this stuff is nonsense. That's just, that's just artificial. The real reason is to, is to stop China's rise, to contain it.
and to stop its rise, and not just to contain it, but stop its rise. So the, the, the narrative in both countries is very bad. Now, both of these narratives have become self-fulfilling prophecies because the more uh, each side sees the other side with that, that narrative, the more it reinforces their own narrative. And so it just gets worse and worse because if, if you think I'm trying to contain you and then you're st you're, you're, you, you have to stop me, then I'm seeing you rising and trying to attack me and then I, that re reaffirms that China's rise is a threat. And when, I'm, when I react to and do certain things, which the U.S. administration is doing now, then China sees that's a confirmation that you're just trying to stop China's rise. And so you have what's called a vicious positive feedback cycle, where each cycle makes it worse and worse. So you have to break that cycle. President Xi is strong enough, and President Trump is mercurial enough to be able to break a cycle. So I think both individuals, in different ways, um, can, break a, can help break a cycle. And so in many cases that China is now a fully developed country in many respects. So therefore the same rules or the same way of thinking that applied back then, which was okay, is not okay today. And so whether it's certain types of economic uh, 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 protectionism in terms of closed markets or intellectual property protection uh, or certain types of uh, cyber um, uh, uh, activities that when China was a, a, a purely developing country and small or joint ventures that China had, uh, f uh, had technology transfer to, to have joint venture, these kinds of things were fine when China was a developing country, but now when China is, is now fully much more developed, even though not fully developed, uh, they're not as appropriate because China has changed. And so the way to harmonize the two different points of view, the U.S. saying, the well, China saying the U.S. started the fight, China and the U.S. saying it's about time we fought back, the difference is if you understand how China has changed during this 20-year period, if you understand that, then both sides can make sense. And you can, you can legitimately understand the concerns of both sides in this process. And so if you take away the malevolence that China is, is plotting, um, like this, this master plan that every Monday morning all the people in China get together on a phone call and say, how are we going to take over the world? That's not, that's not the way it works. That's not the case. Uh, what is the case is that people are just trying to do what's in their own best interest, and China has many problems they're trying to solve. And so the U.S. needs to appreciate that, and China needs to appreciate that some of the, the, the things that have been done in the past is not appropriate to do in the future. And the irony is, is that this is appreciated, that the, uh, you know, the leadership in China understands that, and, and a lot of the changes that they're doing are not because the U.S. is forcing it, but because it's good for China. And so you have, so if you understand the, this conflict in its historical context, you can understand the motivation and reasoning why the change has occurred without attributing malevolent motives to the other side. Because both sides think there's a malevolent motive. The U.S. wants to contain China and hold its rise. Whereas the majority of China experts and policymakers are not that, I know them, that, not, that wasn't the case. Five years ago, eight years ago, wasn't the case. Today it is the case. Why is that? So you have to understand this historical um, change, and both sides need to, <clears throat> need to make changes uh, in order to kind of come up with a new reality. The old... WTO was one reality at that time. Things have changed dramatically. So there needs to be a reset uh, to a new reality, a new structural reality, in which um, China needs to make changes from the way it operated 20 years ago and continues to operate in many cases. So China needs to make changes. China's prepared to do that. The smart people in China know that's good for China.
China wants to be a role model in the world in terms of business and morality, so it has to make those changes uh, to, to truly be a world leader. Uh, so China does want to make those changes, and the U.S. has to recognize that in China making those changes, there has to be an appreciation that China was not breaking the rules, but rather living under a different set of rules that was appropriate at the time, that's no longer appropriate now because of this dramatic change. So the U.S. needs to appreciate that and respect China's dignity and pride uh, which, it, it, which is very legitimate in this, tr in this transition. So China's going through a transition because of its dramatic transformation. Um, and both sides need to manage that transition uh, in a thoughtful manner. And by understanding the historical context is to me the way to, 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 to see it rationally, not imputing malevolent motives. The relationship between China and the U.S. is the most important relationship for the benefit of both peoples and for the peace and prosperity of the entire world. I mean, that's just, a, that's just an absolute given. Um, and the, um, the, the uh, path we're on right now is, it doesn't lead to the right place. Um, there, there is a, a, a heightened... Uh, sense of antagonism that is per pervasive in both countries about the other and getting worse. So it's a serious problem. It's a serious problem. Uh, Trump began the process talking about the tr trade deficit, which no serious economist uh, thinks is very important. But what he did do is by coming up with uh, wrong, uh, wrong reasons, um, he, he enabled other people who had more subtle and more, more thoughtful concerns to be able to start speaking. And so it, it's an odd situation that has occurred. Um, one, one prominent American um, thought leader made a comment that whoever the next president is going to be after Trump, uh, Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter, is going to accuse Trump of being soft on China. So what that means is that there's a deep sentiment uh, in the U.S. that transcends uh, the politics. And if you look at the political campaign, China seems to be the only subject in which the Democrats are not being very critical of Trump. If they're being critical, he, they, they think he should be tougher. Uh, so that's a very disturbing reality. And uh, con conversely, uh, or pa in parallel, you know, the Chinese media uh, is uh, extremely uh, negative and, and, and uniform in their neg negativity. About, uh, about the U.S. in terms of uh, what it does. And so people, when people see that, then even though the, the, the many people in the U.S. don't agree with Trump, of course, on anything, but they see the attack on him, and then that makes them more antagonistic. So you have a situation in both countries where both countries are making it worse uh, right now. And as I said, I think uh, President Xi um, is, is strong enough in his position and, and Trump is uh, changeable enough that, that I'm hoping that they can have a, um, a breakthrough. The best advice I would have uh, to both sides is to try to understand why the other side thinks the way they do. Put yourself in the other side to come to some sort of an agreement that is a, um, that respects, that recognizes the, that China has to make some changes in terms of its relationships, in terms of its economic and activities. At the same time, the U.S. recognizes that China has certain developmental models that have worked for China, a certain, uh, its political system, its uh, a certain, um,
a, 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 a need as any country would, but China in particular, to have a certain dignity and pride uh, that is uh, appreciated and respected. Um, and therefore to come up with a, 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 a solution to some of these issues, recognizing that. Um, if, if we achieve that, we're not going to achieve you know, harmony between the U.S. and China. We will, we will prevent it from getting worse. And my hope is that over time, it will be seen to be in the best interest of both countries to gradually build up a, a trust that has been largely eroded. And, and then over time, it, it, can, it can get better because ultimately, uh, for any of the major issues of economics or climate change, there's great commonality between the U.S. and China. And the differences are very, very small uh, compared to them.